Great. Okay. Let's make a start. Uh, thank you everyone for joining um, today. This is uh, the first installment for a while that we've had um, for the big seminar series at SciLife Lab, uh, which is the Bioinformatics and Genomics. It's a seminar series co-organized by Envis and the NGI uh, under the SciLife Lab flag. And the idea is we invite speakers uh, in the field to come and come and give talks and uh, kind of network with everyone. And also that everyone uh, within the SciLife Lab Genomics and Bioinformatics communities can kind of chat and, and also network. Normally that we do these in person and have free FICA for those of you who have been here before, but of course, uh, due to the ongoing situation, that was that's not really possible this time. So um, stay tuned, hopefully next year, we'll have some more talks and get, get, get back to the, the old routine of having them in, in person. Um, today, I'm really, really happy to invite Artem to give a talk, uh, a uh, exciting talk about, uh, about his project. He's from hailing from, from Canada, so he's got up really early uh, to talk to us today, which is much appreciated. Um, and he's at the University of British Columbia, but will soon be coming, uh, coming over to a closer, closer to us, and he'll be uh, joining a group at, in Cambridge at the MRC next year. So uh, now is a great time to kind of get on his uh, get on his list of potential collaborators. Uh, so I know he's excited to kind of meet some people here. So please, if you have any questions, uh, drop them into the Zoom chat. Or if you're watching on YouTube, drop them into the, the YouTube chat and uh, we'll, we'll flag them up at the end. I will re relay the questions. Um, and of course, also, if you want to chat to Artem afterwards, let, let us know and we can set up some kind of private meetings. Um, I th already had one question, will this be recorded? Yeah, we're live streaming to YouTube. Uh, that YouTube video will be available afterwards as well. So this will be up on YouTube for whenever you like. And with that, um, I'd like to hand over to Artem. Thank you again for joining us. And it's a, it's a real privilege to hear you talk. No, please. Thank you very much for inviting me. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, that's great. OK. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me, Phil. Um, you know, it's a real pleasure to get to share some of the things I've been working on essentially since the pandemic started. Uh, and, you know, I, I can't imagine a, a group of other scientists kind of more appropriate to share it with than all of you at SciLab. Um, you know, I've been, I, so uh, I'll start with the presentation and, and then, you know, um, so my name is Artem Babian, as, as Phil mentioned, and uh, I'm going to be sharing with you a small project since the beginning of the pandemic called Serratus. Um, essentially, it's an ultra high throughput sequence aligner that we've kind of turned to discover new coronaviruses. Um, you know, and uh, the motivation seems to be almost kind of trivial to try to convince you that it's important to study these viruses right now. But I was thinking I, I would kind of explain how we came about doing this. So uh, when the pandemic started, you know, I, I work on ribosomal RNA genetic variation. That's kind of my wheelhouse. And, um, you know, it became immediately obvious, you know, this is not going to be just the normal outbreak of a new virus. And it really, I think, is, is the responsibility of all scientists to do something about it and contribute in any way they can. And so that's, that's why we kind of turn this project uh, towards viral discovery. And, you know, I, I see the exact same thing happening with kind of next flow and the next floor core team, right? I've been lurking in your Slack for a little while and um, it, I, I see the same thing that we're working on coronavirus bioinformatics pipelines. So th that's really where we're going. And, and I want to be clear kind of up front, like, you know, this, I, I was heading up this project, but really it was a collaborative effort between about 13 scientists and we all worked really diligently, really hard together. And, and that's kind of, this is now the outcome. Um, so yeah, please, if you have any questions, you know, we're going to be talking quite a bit about coronaviruses, but open up your minds, you know, with kind of the, some of the technology I'm going to be showing you and, and try to come up with new and creative ways to apply it. And essentially that's where we're moving forward is to really push the envelope with this type of technology. Um, so now the, the regular motivation. So, you know, SARS-CoV-2 or the COVID-19 virus uh, came from a bat coronavirus somewhere in China. It really emerged in the Wuhan wet market where, 
And early on, there were these reports that, oh, they possibly had recombined with a bit of a pangolin virus. And so this recombination really is over uh, the small region of the spike protein, which is responsible for binding to the human ACE2 receptor. And so this, this allowed for kind of a tropic shift. Now it's a little bit controversial if this was actually a recombination event or if it was kind of convergent evolution. And, and what we know from that kind of pangolin virus is that it was actually related to, um, sorry, it was actually related, like it was its own branch of that lineage. So there's a little bit of controversy there, but more or less what you should know is that that, that little change in the spike uh, protein is essentially what has been driving this tropic or this shift of hosts from the bats to pretty much a bunch of other species. And so early on in this pandemic, essentially, you know, it was, it was kind of like astounding. So much sequencing data was being poured into SARS-CoV-2 and everyone was essentially sequencing these genomes. And so, you know, thousands of SARS-CoV-2 genome sequences were becoming available. Uh, I think that number is at about 215,000 on GSED as of last night. And so we kind of had a very simple idea is that instead of kind of, you know, the pandemic happened where we have this point of origin and everyone is looking forward, seeing how this thing is unfolding. Our idea was, okay, what if we stand, we're standing at the same place as everyone else. Let's focus our attention exactly the other way. Let's try to understand uh, where this virus came from proximately and then where coronaviruses from an evolutionary standpoint came from. And so we're really looking the other way on this evolutionary tree. And coronaviruses are actually kind of well studied, but a lot of the coronaviruses are actually only known from small amplicons. So one of the ways that scientists will kind of discover a coronavirus is just by using primers and looking for a conserved chunk of coronaviruses. And you know, there are many of these species where the only known sequence is just a, this conserved chunk of, around the RDRP or RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And we, we kind of ask this really critical question of, are we missing sequence biodiversity of coronaviruses? You know, this, this bat slash pangolin one kind of seemed to almost have come out of nowhere. But, and can we do kind of a, a real big search for new coronaviruses? Um, and one of the most kind of striking points that, you know, we kind of early on were really worried about is there was evidence biochemically and then actually, uh, in cell line data and stuff, um, that SARS-CoV-2 can potentially infect over 80 species of mammal. So that shift, that little pangolin bit actually caused a major tropic shift where this new virus can infect a bunch of species. So if this SARS-CoV-2 virus now enters another species, uh, and that species has its own coronavirus, this actually leads to the possibility of further recombination events. And again, if you're changing the outside, the spike, and the outer core of that protein, when that re-enters humans, it's almost as if a new virus has re-entered humans. And so all of this work on vaccines, uh, on our own herd immunity, that can just be washed away. And so there's actually a very real risk of... Um, a secondary kind of not like a second wave like we're undergoing now but essentially a new type of virus um, or like an antigenic shift a way to think about that is kind of influenza undergoes this quite often and you know that was early on we're like oh that you know theoretically this is possible and essentially since there's been tons of news reports on exactly these types of things beginning to happen uh, Early on, there were tigers. There's the Brooklyn Tigers. Here's a news report about tigers in Knoxville. Uh, dogs, cats were, uh, can become infected, so pets. And probably the saddest story uh, is this mass culling of minks who had become infected and uh, have their own, the coronavirus had gained mutations in the minks. Um, and so Denmark has had to cull its entire mink industry. Uh, and I think that's, that's millions of animals. Again, it's really unfortunate. Like we kind of, you know, you kind of think, oh, this theoretically can happen, but then to actually see it happen, it, it, it's a bit heartbreaking. So, you know, we came up with this idea of serratus and on paper, essentially it was, okay, I want to search 
every single sequencing library uh, that is available. Every bit of DNA or RNA that has come off of a sequencer in the last 13 plus years as we've undergone the sequencing revolution in bioinformatics and computational biology. We kind of refine that a little bit to focusing on uh, samples where there's going to be RNA, so we, excluding DNA sequences. And, you know, doing an inventory of this, there's over, there's just over 3.8 million biological samples from all parts of the world uh, that have been collected over the last 13 years. Um, and our job was, okay, we need to search that and find every coronavirus. You know, the, the goal is always like, we're going to liberate every coronavirus sequence that has, has been sequenced already. And this actually, if you think about this from kind of like an ecological experiment, it's like we're doing a giant ecology study and we have biological samples spanning the entire world in many different contexts. Um, so that actually amounted to just uh, over 5.6 petabases. So a petabase is a million, million base pairs. Uh, I was trying to put this huge number into context. And so that's just about if we had a haploid genome from every person in Sweden, that is how much sequence data that we are searching. So the architecture that we came up with, um, and I'll talk a little bit about this today. Um, really, it was, it was kind of an exercise in, in learning and then aggressively cost optimizing cloud computing. Um, uh, can I just interrupt you a second, Adam? Sorry, we've lost your yeah. slides. I don't know if that was intentional. Oh, no. Um, let me see, what, what do we see? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I just need a second. Sorry, I'll reboot this. But essentially, what we did was aggressively cost optimize this cloud computing. And the idea was that, um, you know, we, sorry, I just wanna. All right, I'll need a second. It's distracting to do both at once. Can you see it now? Nothing yet. Okay, um, I think it's joining now. So as we are cost optimizing, the idea was to make sure that every single little bit of this pipeline was working essentially for as cheap as possible. Because when you're doing something that's you know a million, um, There we go. Uh, when you're doing something that's a million samples, you know, if we we're paying a dollar a sample, this would essentially become fully uh, prohibitive to do. Sorry about that. Um, and so the, the architecture is essentially designed around, uh, I would say that the design philosophy is to make this as hyper parallel as possible. And so we, we break down the problems into the smallest kind of atomic units that work on the AWS system. And by, by like designing the pipeline around the hardware, uh, we essentially are able to scale things up to a much larger extent. Uh, so I should say there was one more really important detail of why we chose Amazon systems um, is that purely by coincidence in February of 2020, Amazon and Google had mirrored all of the SRA data to their own networks. And so what normally is the bottleneck, if you can imagine running kind of this pipeline in your head is you have to download all of this data from Maryland, from NCBI. And so that would essentially be prohibitively slow to try to download petabytes of data. You know, it essentially would be cheaper to fly there and fly some hard drives at that point. But Amazon had mirrored it locally to uh, its US East one uh, kind of server farm. And so we were able to access it essentially as if it was sitting on a hard drive already and our computers are essentially connected to it. Um, 
so the first module, so going over the bioinformatics, it's actually really, really simple. So, you know, the first set of cluster or what we're calling a module is the downloading cluster. And here you're essentially prefetching the data, uh, which is just getting kind of a compressed version, decompressing it to FastQ using FastQ dump, which is a very standard tool. And then we do something that we split each FastQ file into a section of about 1 million reads. And I'll get back to this in a second. And that is then piped to a S3 cache space. And so what we're, you know, what we were able to accomplish is that you're using about uh, over 1400 instances. Each one has four CPUs. So we're able to simultaneously download uh, 5,840 uh, accessions, right? So we're, we're accessing about 5,000 files at once. That's 20 gigabytes a second. And the way to think about this, and this is kind of the central idea behind all of this architecture, is that, you know, if you use one really big computer, it could be faster by just straight computing. But by using many smaller computers, the networking IO or the disk IO, the ability to kind of read and write data gets multiplied for every additional computer that you're using because they all have the same kind of, um, you know, limit. Like there's only so much data you can move in and out of a, a single node. And by using many of them, it, it actually operates similar to like a RAID zero hard drive setup where um, every computer has its own. And then that allows us to essentially eliminate the biggest bottleneck in doing this kind of petabase scale computing. And that is the, the IO of moving data in and off uh, of a CPU. So what I was saying about it being kind of parallel is that every file after it's decompressed, it's broken down into a block of about 1 million reads per block. And then these blocks are treated separately in the alignment part of the cluster. And again, this is really exploding the ability to read the data. Um, you know, we, we think a lot about like CPU speed, how fast does the CPU work? But when doing this, it really all came down to doing IO and IO optimizations. Um, so the way to think about it here is that you have say one file of 100 million reads, instead of reading it once from start to finish and kind of going through it, you're reading it at 100 places at once. So it's kind of like you have a pipe, but you kind of turn the pipe sideways and then you can stuff more data through it. So the align module, which is kind of the real workhorse, you know, we just use Bowtie 2 very sensitive local settings and then pipe that into SAM tools. Uh, we used compute optimized nodes, so just over 4,000. That gave us over 16,000 simultaneous alignments uh, processing about 100 gigabytes a second of these FASTQ files. And again, all of, you know, it, it wasn't the computing that was the bottleneck, really. It was the I.O. And then by using this parallel system, we're able to essentially massively multiply our throughput. Um, there was also a Grafana and Prometheus. We, we had real-time tracking of every single node on the system. So this cost about 1% to 2% of overall CPU usage. But this gave us real-time feedback on how the entire cluster is running. And so if something, if there was an error in any part of the pipeline, or if some files weren't working from NCBI, we would recognize it within a second uh, or two. And then we could just kind of tune down different parts of the cluster. So here it is running operationally. And you can see, you know, we're downloading 83,000 accessions per hour, and we're aligning about 60,000 accessions per hour, which uh, if you do the math, this means that in a single day, we're able to process over a million sequencing libraries, ultimately for a cost of under one US cent per library. So we're talking about massive, truly petabase scale sequence alignment done in, in almost no time. To put this into kind of a bigger scale, that ended up meaning that we did about 713 computing years in a mere seven days for this project. Uh, and here's just a breakdown of what this looks like. So, you know, in 24 hours, we got 1.29 million accessions. 
And you can see that when we actually monitored the costs for a few of these runs to see you know, where everything's happening, we were essentially able to eliminate everything except for computing, which is the dark blue, which is what you would want. You're only really paying for running that CPU. Everything else, we, we've optimized the way. And so you know, that, that's how we can get it down to that price of under a penny. There were a lot of kind of unintended, uh, you know, we can call it features. Um, by having a very decentralized modular pipeline, if there was ever an error in any part of the pipeline, you're actually able to kind of pause the workflow and go back to it because all of the data is cached at every single step. Um, and by breaking the problem down into these small kind of atomic bits, all of the CPU usage was very predictable and it was very uniform, which is really nice to work with because you, we didn't have to worry very much about huge fluctuations in file size. And so, you know, say for the aligner nodes, we knew that like all of our like uh, blocks were going to be of a million uh, reads big. And so the disk space, we only had about 10 gigabytes of disk space per node. We didn't have to pay to accommodate the, uh, the extreme ends of the pipeline because everything was broken down into units. And then, you know, this all essentially meant big and fast. Big computer make big compute. Um, early on, we realized actually looking at only coronavirus sequences is probably selling ourselves short um, because the CPU wasn't really as big of a bottleneck as we thought it would be. Um, so we actually expanded to not only every coronavirus sequence filtered down to 99% identity, we did every vertebrate virus, uh, every RefSeq vertebrate virus, I should say. And, you know, in line with kind of the human genome project, all of our code is GPLv3 and all of the data. So this is what I kind of am most proud of is that um, we kind of negotiated amongst everyone that was working. Um, where all of the data is in the public domain and we're working hard to make sure that that data is also accessible. So we're trying to follow, uh, you know, different, uh, to make everything machine learnable and everything. So I'd really encourage everyone, if you're interested in virology, this is probably one of the coolest data sets that's out there. And, you know, it's, it's all sitting there free. So we've reduced down about 50 petabytes of fast Q sequence data to about five terabytes of sequence data, which is then reduced down to a SQL database of about uh, 17 gigabytes. So I will just mention one thing, because I know that a lot of people who do this type of metagenomics, they will very often ask like, oh, why not just use something like Kraken uh, or a Kamer-based method? Uh, why bother with the sequence alignment? And the answer is essentially, we really wanted to use the shortest possible seeds because when we're, you're looking for divergent sequences, um, you know, if you're using a 32 mer and the virus is not identical to a known virus, you very quickly lose the ability to detect a new virus using something like that 32 or 64 mer. And then something like a 22 mer is, is, is kind of a, a bit messy. But essentially a month of our time was spent like going back and forth between this alignment versus Kamer based methods. And at the end of the day, the alignments being easy to inspect is really what won it out. The fact that we can go to a BAM file, look in an alignment and right away, you know, if you have a real virus or a false positive, that was kind of the, the money. Um, so yeah, I guess what that looks like on data is you can see the Kamers drop off very quickly. So this is a um, theoretical, so this is a simulated SARS-CoV-2 genome where you just add mutations and you can see the alignment actually can tolerate mutations because it uses a shorter seed sequence, 22 nucleotides, which is then extended versus the Kamer of 32 MERS. And then, you know, I, I don't think I have to convince you that alignment is, is actually pretty sensitive and specific. They worked pretty well. So overall, after searching these 3.8 million libraries, we found about 52,000 potentially coronavirus positive libraries. Um, we assembled all of them, which is its own kind of little adventure. But essentially, we did that in two or three days, again, using AWS. This part was not cheap. Uh, you pay about 20 cents per assembly here. Um, and then 
from that, we had 11,000, over 11,000 coronavirus contigs that we could detect. And you can see the breakdown here is we also scored every library with the idea being that, you know, to kind of accommodate false positives, false negatives. And the score actually is a pretty good reflection, as you can see here, of what's the, uh, say, probability that you assemble a coronavirus given a certain score. So as you can see, the score dropping, um, or sorry, the score, as the score increases, the fraction of libraries with that score it, um, that assemble a coronavirus goes up quite substantially. Um, one of the things that we kind of weren't expecting is that actually coronaviruses on the whole, especially relative to all other viruses, are very well studied. Um, so you can see them in the top corner here, but um, you know, as you're going from divergence, nucleotide sequence divergence, here starting at 75 to 100, and the breakdown of where we're seeing these reads aligned to the reference sequences, the coronaviruses are, are very well understood, which means that there's act, given the sequence data that's available on the SRA, there's actually not a whole lot of coronaviruses to be discovered relative to these other viruses. Uh, another way to think about this is, yeah, okay, coronaviruses are well studied, but there's a lot of undiscovered viruses, uh, especially if you go to kind of some of the more obscure uh, or less studied ones like Rio virus things that you know, aren't kind of hot, um, you can see that this entire distribution is shifted. So there's a lot of kind of undiscovered sequence diversity here. Uh, one way that I like to draw this, but uh, is that if you imagine that we're just illuminating a light on a street, on a dark street, um, where what we see with our light depends on our reference sequence input, right? So that's the brightest. And then as you go uh, sequence divergence outward, you can see kind of more around the edges. And so you can see here, again, those real viruses, we put in a little bit of kind of known sequence and that's what we're seeing, but we get a lot of this periphery of these undiscovered or undercharacterized viruses. Whereas something like the coronaviruses you know, what we put in is largely what we see, but there is still a rim uh, to be discovered. And really that rim is very biologically interesting. It's kind of, it's nice that we weren't super overwhelmed with a ton of sequences. We could focus on some of the most interesting sequences biologically. So the first one that I'd like to highlight, and, and literally it's just because this was the first one, uh, is Frank the Bat. So he's a bat, he's from Peru, he likes to hang out. Uh, he's a vampire bat, so he's a total sucker for llamas. Uh, and in a metagenome sample from Frank, we got a hit for what looked to be quite a divergent coronavirus. So when we went to the sequence alignment, this is what it looked like. So this is a, again, this is an amplicon from a bat in Trinidad that was the reference sequence. And then when we aligned Frank's reads to it, you could see that there's a lot of sequence variation here. and a part of this uh, contained this conserved core of the RNA dependent RNA polymerase. And that's where we got kind of the majority of the reads. So um, this is actually a really important phenomenon that we kind of recurrently see is that there's these small parts of these genomes that, are, that have the highest evolutionary conservation. And using those, when we get hits in them, we can then find very divergent sequences. So this is where uh, seed and extend of alignment works really, really well. Whereas if you look at 32 mers, no 32 mer uh, from Frank the Bat would match any known coronavirus. And so that, that was reading complete zeros. Um, we, for every single library that we've processed, we make these kind of summary files. So it's just a short text file that kind of has some summary statistics. This is out now all built into an SQL database. Um, but going back to Frank the Bat, we assembled that library and we got a 29 KB, uh, essentially a whole genome from this virus. And when you blast that whole genome end to end, the closest known virus, oh, did, did I lose the, the screen feed again? Yeah, we did. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, the closest known virus to that coronavirus is actually human NL63. So this is the closest known whole genome was a human coronavirus, which is very unexpected. Um, 
give me just one second, let me retry and I will get back. Does anyone have any questions so far? I think that's kind of the first major part on, on the computational side of things. Maybe I can, I can ask a quick one myself. Um, did you launch all of this in one go or how did you kind of orchestrate it? I know you monitored it as you ran it, but did he, did he kind of go, okay, I want to see the entire SOA and hit a big red button? <laughs> it, it eventually got to that point, yes, where we were, uh, I'm sharing. So, you know, we, we were running it kind of in pilots. We, we broke it down based on uh, uh, essentially the, what, like what, source sequences they were. So, you know, we focused a lot on uh, where we thought there would be what's called like zoonotic viruses. So the first sets were, you know, a mere like, I guess the very first ones were like a thousand sequences, but then we, we would go to something like, you know, 60,000 and we, we would optimize on 60,000. What I'm showing you is what we were running um, on, I think that was the invertebrate set. So that was, 2 million libraries. So eventually we got to a point where you could just load in uh, about 250,000 SRA accessions and it would just start churning through those. And that's where we could kind of get this measurements of like millions a day. Um, but it wasn't all kind of all at once from the get go. Oh no. If that's, uh, let me just get over here. Okay, right. So from those, so that was Frank the Bat. Yeah, so it's nuclear, the percent identity was 70%. Uh, so what I just wanted to note here is that, um, you know, that, that's below kind of the theoretical detection limit, but that's again, because of these conserved cores. We use conserved bits of the genomes to detect the virus. And then um, when you, assemble it, that's when you get kind of the more sequence variation, things in like the spike. So we assembled 11,000 coronavirus uh, libraries, We're about four, just over 4,000 contained RGRP, and then we built a phylogenetic tree based on those RGRP. Now the most striking, we, we got three new, um, so from those thousands, we didn't get, a, a, you know, hundreds of new viruses. But what we did get is we got a few new alpha coronaviruses, including Frank the Bat, a new beta coronavirus, and a new delta coronavirus. Um, so here we're defining new kind of at 97%, which is a very stringent threshold. If you're saying new species, um, only one of them, uh, Frank, is kind of a new species in the classical coronaviruses. But by far the most interesting biology was the things that we were not expecting. You know, why do you do a big unbiased search is because you want to know what are we really ignorant of. And so one of the things that came up was um, these groups, which we're just tentatively calling group E because they're alpha, beta, gamma, delta coronaviruses. And then there's this group E. Um, it's not monophyletic uh, for anyone that's like a kind of nitpicky with taxonomy, but these were a group of viruses that were found all in aquatic vertebrates. So, it, you know, the, the hallmark, the like big one for us was this axolotl one. That was just because that's the one that we focused on the most. Um, and so we named them after the Latin species name. So um, um, Amex NV for nidovirus. Then we have the uh, Coretta Coretta, which is a sea turtle. And when you look at overall the, the kind of phylogeny here is, yeah, okay, we were looking for beluga whales with this giant search, but we actually discovered, oh, there's these things that are called narwhals. Um, and these group E viruses are very similar to coronaviruses phylogenetically. You know, I, I would say that they're corona-like. Um, they technically violate the textbook definition of what a coronavirus is, so because you know, as I'll get to in one second, but uh, it, it just from their placement, I would say they are probably coronavirus and we should probably be refining our textbook definition. So if you look at just the RDRP identity, 
um, they almost fall into being their own order. So here's the relationship between these viruses and then uh, the nearest uh, alpha, beta, gamma, delta coronaviruses. Um, so they're, they're just about the similarity that you would expect uh, coronavirus um, group to coronavirus group. Now, what was outstanding about these is that when you looked at, uh, here we used in HMM models to kind of find every domain in the contigs that we were having, a lot of these, uh, a chunk of these viruses that were related to one another most closely were always uh, partial. So we can never get a complete genome out of them. So that, here's just a close up. So you can see the SARS-CoV-2 uh, models at the top and you get complete coverage, but we're missing uh, a good chunk of this spike. So the most variable region. So we were worried that you know, our assembly wasn't working well. But then when you go to the axolotl ones, we were able to find that you know, this, this RDRP containing chunk was present in uh, something like 28 libraries. And in all of them, we would always get those contigs finishing at just about the same position. And so what was actually happening is that these viruses have segmented genomes. Um, the closest one that was in uh, Pacific salmon also has a segmented genome, but it was annotated as having a complete genome in the reference file. And, you know, it's just kind of one of these coincidences that Gideon, who discovered the Pacific salmon needle virus, he was also at UBC and, you know, essentially we're buddies. Um, and so we were chatting about this and, you know, he was never able to actually show in the lab that the RDRP chunk and the spike chunk are on the same molecule, right? And all of his attempts to show that this is one molecule also had failed and never was able to assemble it. And so when, when we see this in many different viruses and many uh, different libraries, so many replicates of the same virus, it's a pretty fair conclusion that these, these viruses have segmented genomes. And this is where I'm saying this challenges the textbook definition of what a coronavirus can be. And then if you kind of extend that, you know, where else do we know segmented genomes? Influenza is probably the best example. So this actually leads to a really, I think, important biological question where you have a group of coronaviruses that if they have segmentation, they can have what's called reassortment, where different coronaviruses that are kind of related or not even that related can swap not just recombination like little bits of DNA, but actually just swap out a full spike or swap out a full RDRP set. So in the same way that you get antigenic shifts like H1N1 versus H5N5, um, you know, that's an antigenic shift because of the segmentation. These coronaviruses are likely will undergo the same type of phenomenon. Uh, lucky for us that so far we haven't found anything like this in mammals or anything like this that can infect humans. But this does tell us something about the basic evolutionary potential of coronaviruses. They need not be one linear genome. One of the other kind of approaches that we could take with this was uh, we could actually look at the metadata that was associated with each of these sequencing runs and then the virus that we found out of it and the expected virus host relationship. So under 1% of the coronavirus libraries were what we're calling discordant between virus and host. The best examples to, to think about quickly are there were quite a few samples where it was taken from a plant and we would find either a porcine, a pig, or a um, chicken coronavirus in this plant. And so obviously the conclusion isn't that the plants were being infected by coronavirus. It was most likely um, that the, the virus, say the pig one is called porcine endemic diarrhea virus. So probably the fertilizer that was used on these corn fields contained coronaviruses. And then when people were sequencing the corn, the coronavirus comes up. And so the most interesting, again, biologically, I, I say this to kind of caveat what I, I will say next. And uh, we actually identified two human children that were sequenced in 2010 in St. Louis that had what is called fever of unknown or pyrexia of unknown origin or a fever, but no one knew what the fever was causing. And when we, you know, pulled down this huge amount of sequencing, 
they actually had about 400,000 reads mapping with 99% identity. So a very strong match to a murine hepatitis virus. So this is a beta coronavirus affecting um, mice. And there is in vitro evidence, so cell line evidence that this MHV can infect humans, but we've never seen it uh, actually infect a person. And the fact that we see this in two children in all the replicates means that this was probably a zoonotic event. So, you know, what happened in China in November of last year happened in St. Louis in 2010. But something early on didn't let this virus have that kind of sustained human to human transmission. And so this means that, you know, coronavirus zoonosis probably occurs quite often. And these initial infections will happen, have very limited human to human spread, but then not really take off as a pandemic like we saw. I think that this um, raises a really important point because we need to be monitoring people in non-biased ways, especially if they have in what appears to be respiratory infections and you don't know what the origin of that infection is. It's critical to kind of intervene and find out early. And, and now I think we very clearly show that at least the computing side of this is not a bottleneck at all. If you're paying under a penny to process and analyze that, that sequencing library. And so, you know, you can ask yourself a question like what can we do moving forward? Where can we find say SARS-CoV-2 in November of 2019 intervene aggressively early and then subsequently not have this, you know, I think it was estimated at a $16 trillion cost to, I think that's just the US economy. And so, uh, sorry, I should say uh, the other, no other virus was uh, identified in these samples. So there was a little bit from uh, herpes virus, but it most likely was this murine hepatitis virus. But this doesn't prove that it was a true infection. That's the caveat. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly switch gears here, if I may. Um, so not only have we, you know, built out this big database, we actually created a website to try to make this data as accessible as possible. So here, serratus.io, um, floor, you'll be taken to this interface and you can actually find and search. So uh, the back end of this is an SQL server where we take those summary files and, and essentially make a database out of them. And then there's an API that interfaces that. You can access that SQL server directly in R as well. We have a package called Tantalus, but uh, for the web interface, you can you know, find your favorite, say I'm interested in hantaviruses, right? And then you can search view matches. Oh no. The risk of uh, <laughs> the risk of a live demo. Okay, I think that. Oh, you can see my screen. Right there, we go. Okay, so you can subset the score and the nucleotide identity, and then for every viral family or for every individual GenBank sequence or for an individual SRA run, you get this kind of overview of the coverage in that library. So say for this Hunter virus, there is a virus here. You can see SRA, this SRA, if we click on it, um, the Hunter viruses, the reads in this library have 95% identity and it most closely matches Tulu virus segment M. Um, and this was, in a metazoan species. And then you can actually just view the alignment. And because we're also hosting the BAM and the index files, um, you can directly query those BAM files on S3 and go directly to the alignment. So essentially you can go from like a question of like, oh, I'm, I'm interested in finding a new virus, to looking at the reads of that virus aligned to its closest reference uh, in you know essentially a few seconds. Uh, this is, a really powerful tool if you're interested in viral discovery. I highly encourage everyone to check it out. It's kind of a 
a time sink where you're like, you can spend a lot of time looking at those things because, um, yeah, here, here's an example. Um, you know, what now is the trick? I, I guess the conclusion that I want to draw from this is, um, we've already done the computing, you know, every viral read, uh, that matches a vertebrate virus in the SRA, we have it in an accessible database. It is queryable by machine. You can very quickly visualize that data and actually confirm that it is correct or not. So distinguishing false positives, false negatives. The real problem now is essentially human curation. And this is one of those things where, you know, like, please, please use this. You know, we make this public domain for a reason. The idea is that uh, we have a collectively assembled this huge amount of data not just us, but the world scientific community. And we should do our best to curate these viruses because right now, yeah, we're facing SARS-CoV-2 in this pandemic, but we don't know necessarily what the next pandemic is going to be. And so it's important to kind of explore all of that. Remember those RNA viruses, coronaviruses are well studied, but there's a lot of undiscovered viruses. I think uh, in, in our manuscript, we have a low end estimate of at least 5,000, sorry, 4,800 uh, high probability viruses that are novel and contain many, many reads. Um, so one kind of toy case uh, that we followed up in the paper was there is a hepatitis D virus. So, and that virus has, Historically, there was it was it's only it was the Delta. It's called the Delta virus, and it was the only virus of its kind of uh, genera. Um, and in the last year, so literally this vampire bat paper and this rat Delta virus, these were discovered this year. Um, so, you know, people are starting to look at novel Delta viruses, and when we turned our attention to Delta viruses right away, we found three new mammalian Delta viruses. So this told us a lot about the evolutionary history of these viruses. What happens is these viruses infect people that also have hepatitis B. They require hepatitis B to undergo reflection, uh, infection, and they seriously increase the risk that these hep B uh, patients have of developing cancer. And so what we found is that one of these Delta viruses was in the woodchuck, uh, Marmata monax. And this woodchuck is actually a model organism that's been used for the last three decades of studying hep B induced cancer. And so as all this is happening, people are using this as a scientific model system. These animals also contain a kind of a virus that can modify the development of that cancer. And so this is potentially a source of, uh, you can say contamination or a confounding factor that affects three decades of cancer research. So there's a lot of potential uh, and very interesting biological stories that come out of uh, understanding the evolutionary histories of all these viruses. Um, what I like to kind of make a distinction about, and I, I think it's something important is that this isn't really so much a, a blast search where we're searching a database for a single sequence. It's important that we use the entire, we use families of viruses to search the database because that, it, it gives us a kind of a database versus database search as opposed to a sequence query versus a database search. And so in that way, you not only build out, okay, what's the closest match to my virus of interest, but everything that's related to it. So we're building out databases of kind of these database versus database searches. And ultimately, you know, um, I've walked you kind of through the story of using this petabase scale sequence alignment for viral discovery, but you should be asking yourself, okay, what else is there left to discover? Uh, or what is the potential to discover? What can we dream up of uh, when we dream at the petascale? And um, with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. I'd like to thank all of the collaborators. So again, you know, this I really couldn't have done this. Everyone essentially came together um, when this pandemic started to break out. You know, we we came together for a common goal, and it, it's been easily the most rewarding and fulfilling 
uh, scientific experience of my life. And um, I, I wouldn't, this is not just my work, this is the work of everyone on this slide. And uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. I'd love to discuss more about uh, the future of bioinformatics and, and high throughput computing. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much for that talk. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, maybe I can kick us off with a couple of questions. Um, oh, we've got a question on Zoom. Uh, Nicholas Delon uh, would like to know how high was the total cost for doing all of this? Right. Um, so the how much did we actually have to pay is zero dollars. Um, you know that it's kind of appropriate that this is on the thank you slide, but um, I, I essentially reached out to Amazon AWS uh, through UBC, this cloud innovation center early on, and they've been really fantastic where they also essentially have just given us, you know, bottomless credits more or less. We have been tracking what it in theory would have cost. So the, the search is, yeah, you know, I, I can't say like we would have done a fraction of what we did if it wasn't for them. So really big thank you to them. Um, if we were to pay for everything, um, so it's kind of hard. To, I can give you the full number. So it's about 160000 if we were to pay for development costs and assembly. So development costs were quite substantial because we are running really inefficient systems and sometimes very inefficient systems at scale. Um, and so like it, it's almost unfair to say that because a lot of that was we knew that time was the most important variable, not like computing credits. And so we maybe cut a few corners at times where we're like, okay, we just need this today because we need to get this data out tomorrow. Um, but the, the core search costs at the end of the day were about 25 to 30,000. Um, that would be in US dollars. The thing that we kind of really got nicked on was the assembly. There's not a, you can't break down the assembly problem in the same way that you can break down the search problem. And so that was running on the order of um, kind of 60 to 80,000. Um, and that's also because, and you know, again, credit to them is we, we were very aggressive in what we were assembling, right? Sometimes these libraries had five reads that matched a coronavirus sequence. And I think any rational person would say, okay, five reads, you're probably not going to be looking at assembling that entire library of 100 million reads, um, but we could um, because we wanted to make sure that we left nothing on the table and no stone unturned. Um, so I've got a question over here on YouTube. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the curation of the findings? If a biologist was reviewing the constructed genomes, what would they be looking for? And what would the curation process look like? Right. So, um, you know, this is, this is where it, it's kind of tricky because essentially every viral family needs its own curation, right? Um, the Delta virus, which was kind of my toy example for a lot of this, um, it only has one protein coding gene and it has uh, two near identical RNA genes. And so it's not just like, oh, run an open reading frame and, and find where the protein is. Um, but that would be kind of a big part of it was just annotating the context. The other kind of side of this, but what I'm trying to say here is that you need to ask this question in the context of a given virus, right? Because every virus will have its own kind of steps towards annotating it successfully. Uh, if you take something like coronavirus, the first thing is, okay, we, we, you know, do we have an assembly or not? If we don't have an assembly, it would essentially be going to the reference sequences. And then what we don't have now is like annotations of protein coding sequences in the reference sequences. That would be really helpful to be able to visualize that. And then a large part of this is, you know, we would go or I would go to like, one of these sequences, I would look at the alignment files 
And then I would just blast the reads. Like I would take, you know, 10 or 20 reads that look like, okay, this, this could be from this virus. Is it something that's known that we maybe missed in our reference input? And so I, you take the read and then you blast it. And you, it'll tell you in a kind of more unbiased ways, is this a known virus or not? So by using that, like it was very easy and obvious to identify, okay, this, this library has a virus that is completely unknown, right? Because like, you know, as I was saying, when you blast it, the closest sequence match was like a human coronavirus and you're looking at a bat uh, with 70% identity. So it's things like that. The other side of this is making... Uh, like visualizing the data. So we have the kind of very rough coverage plots that undergo kind of aggressive binning and everything to make everything quick and responsive. So working on that and making it easier to, to really get to that read level in a more intuitive manner. Um, and then the other side is being able to slice the data more efficiently. This is more on the R package uh, where being able to get to the SQL data and write your queries where you're, it's going to return the most pertinent data. So, you know, what where we have implemented on the website is filter by score and by nucleotide identity. And with those things, you can say, okay, here are the high confidence hits that are divergent from the known uh, hits. There's a lot of work left to be done with trying to identify regions in the reference sequence that are kind of most um, I should say, most indicative that this is actually a true positive or a new virus. So when you go and you look at the false positives, a lot of the false positives happen in the same regions of the genome. Um, from biologically, you can actually really easily understand this as like, um, if you take a virus like bovine viral diarrhea virus, it actually contains a transmembrane open reading frame that was taken from a host. And so every time you search a pig for this bovine viral diarrhea virus, the same region of its genome lights up. And that's because the reads from the pig's transmembrane protein are mapping to the viral one. And so a way to suppress these kind of like hot regions of the reference that aren't indicative of a virus, but are indicative of some kind of, uh, you know, false positive event. Um, it, it's a non-obvious answer. I'm sorry, it's a bit long, but that's because the, the answer is non-obvious and really depends on working together with virologists to, to do this in a way where it's, it's efficient. Yeah. Um, we've got a hand raised on, on Zoom from, from Claudia, so maybe she can ask you a quick, quick question. Yeah, thank you so much, Phil. And yeah, thank you for the very nice presentation. It was really um, impressive. Um, I may have mess, missed this. Um, did you do any correction for the host? So because we know that sometimes um, genomes or the host species might might not be correctly annotated. Uh, like in the um, SRA method, yes, like when we were looking exactly. for zoonosis. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so there's this problem with the host not being correctly annotated. Well, we didn't do this correction. Um, but what we did is that I actually had manually gone through all of the, the hits that were potential zoonotic events. And I would essentially find the associated paper. It, you know, it's like the, the grunt work of bioinformatics. It's not very glamorous, but making sure that that data is correct and polished. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, in that sense, we did do that, this host mm -hmm. correction, but not something systematic where we went through all of SRA and, and did this in a kind of better way. That being said, there are some now techniques. So there's a project at NCBI called STAT. Mm -hmm. So this is a KMER based method and they include mm -hmm. uh, eukaryotic genomes. So there's actually already index numbers of how many reads match a eukaryotic genome um, or a viral genome for that matter in each of these SRA accessions. So you can actually cross reference these uh, quite easily. Um, well, maybe not quite easily, but it's theoretically possible. Mm. And so you would be able to do this in a more systematic way where you're not relying on human annotation, mm. but you can more just look at the data and then given the data, you know, is the host animal nucleic acids present or not? Right. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. 
Yeah, and my second question would relate more to um, the hepatitis D example that you presented. We know about Hep D dependency on Hep B. Did you find um, other viral dependencies as well? Yeah. Um, so the um, Mmon DV, so the woodchuck Delta virus, that was in a study looking at the pathology and development of cancer in response to um, woodchuck hepatitis virus, which is uh, a hepna DNA virus similar to hepatitis B. So humans have hep B and hep D. Uh, woodchucks were known to have essentially their own hep B, which is called woodchuck hep mm -hmm. virus. Um, and we had found a woodchuck hep D. Mm. So essentially the, the relationship that we found that is known in humans also exists in woodchucks. Mm. There, you know, after we had released our preprint, there was another group that had also found this woodchuck virus. They're saying there isn't an association. I think they're wrong because they had found in another study, a woodchuck that had the hep D virus, but didn't have the woodchuck hepatitis virus. Mm -hmm. but they were, that is a sample of peripheral blood and you wouldn't expect the woodchuck hepatitis virus to be in peripheral blood. And yeah. so most likely the helper virus for that woodchuck virus is the woodchuck hepatitis virus. It's the most parsimonious explanation. Um, and we found no other virus in those animals, right? So that kind of rules out any other low hanging fruit. Thank you. Uh, I have a, a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Um, no, please. So uh, I'm, on your slide here, you've got like, um, it's an impressive array of different collaborators working on the project. I was kind of curious how this all started off. Did you start working on this before the coronavirus pandemic or was it kind so, of? So, yeah. Um, so Jeff Taylor, who is listed down here, um, is, is my climbing partner and we had started working on this on March 2nd. Um, and, you know, I, I was going to use this to study, like, I was like, oh, I'm gonna do this huge project. I'm gonna study like, you know, all of GTEx data for ribosomal RNA. And that's what I do, right? And so I was like, let's build this cool architecture. And so we went into lockdown. I went into lockdown March 12th. And then probably by like March 18th, 20th, we had the call where, you know, we sat down, we're like, okay, listen, like, I, I'm gonna put my work aside, like, let's try to focus this on coronaviruses, and try to do something good with this. And so Jeff, I should say, is a software engineer, and like, has no bioinformatics background, he's just strictly was like, really, really good with HPC systems. And so we worked really well together. And then you know, things really started to take a turn by the end of March. Everyone, you know, the gravity of the situation was dawning on people. And there was a lot of uh, coronavirus hackathons happening, including HackSeq, uh, RNA, which I was an organizer of. And so essentially, we, I just took this project to, I think, maybe like five or six different uh, hackathons. And I would just come up with this, you know, like my pitch was easy. I'm like, we're going to search all of the SRA for every coronavirus. Do you want to help? And a lot of people came on, would contribute for, you know, two, three days. And I'm super grateful to all of them that that list is actually quite long. Um, and then slowly more of these people came on and were like, uh, with more of a long-term view. And um, Robert, I just straight emailed him and said, hey, I have a cool problem. You're an amazing bioinformatician. Do you want to help? And he just said yes, which was fun. Um, and, and we essentially assembled this ragtag team in this way. Um, everyone wanted to contribute. Everyone wanted to do something. And, you know, the, the idea was good. And I think it was important. Um, we set it up in an open science project, right? So the notebooks for this project are available on the GitHub. All of the data is public domain. All of the code is GPL3. Um, it wasn't really about like ownership or trying to do something or make something and be like, okay, this is ours. Uh, it was like, we were doing this because we have to. And then using that kind of like philosophy that actually helped Amazon come on board and, and really um, 
at least from the computing side that, you know, would stoke the fire a bit. Um, so yeah, I'm incredibly grateful to everybody. And, um, this is, this is it. We were all volunteers. This definitely seems to be one of the upsides from the, the pandemic is everyone has to work remotely and suddenly it doesn't matter where you are. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's and everyone good. made time too. That's the thing is like, we, we all have like things that we were kind of supposed to be doing, but, uh, you know, everyone put in the time and was willing to, to make an effort. And that was kind of the other thing with this project is like, um, but I, we had set very aggressive deadlines. I think most of the, like once we got most of the positioning in place with the, the architecture, it was like, okay, our goal is to essentially write the manuscript in a month, right? Like let's get all this data and write the paper in a month. It took two in the end, but like, you know, that's to go from kind of an idea and like this might work to everything's ready and together. Um, but that was also because we believe that like what we were doing is important and it's important to get that data out in a tight timeline, right? This isn't something that you can just sit on for like half a year. Um, and what now? Um, are you kind of planning to keep updating this database as new public data is added to the SOA and new viruses? Yeah, yeah, that, you know, that's a, I think that's the, the kind of like million dollar question is like, you know, we built this really big hammer, right? And all of a sudden everything's starting to look like a nail. Um, you know, that I, I'd like to do this more kind of systematically using more than just vertebrate viruses. So essentially going through all of this and doing kind of a second pass. Um, we have this idea of doing uh, kind of iterative searches. So take all the new viral sequences that we found, put them back into the reference space and repeat the search, right? To see, can we go even further? Can we go deeper and find even more kind of deep viruses? Um, there's some evidence that that actually would work quite well, um, but you know, the, you are kind of getting diminishing returns, but if we can do it, that's where kind of the most interesting biology will be because that's the things that like are really, really out there. Um, our imagination is kind of the limit right now. Fantastic. I think on that note, that seems like a good place to stop and if, unless there are any other questions from the audience. Um, I think we can wrap up now. Um, Artem, thank you again for, for talking with us today. That was a really inspiring talk um, and no, really exciting project. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, thank you everyone for taking the time. Um, you know, please shoot me an email, check out serratus.io uh, and the GitHub. And, uh, you know, if, if you have any ideas, if you'd like to talk, let me know. If you have a virus that you're interested in, let me know and uh, we can get you that data as easily and painlessly as possible. Um, thanks. Thanks very much. Take it easy. <laughs>